I think next here we have Terry from Carvana, who's going to be joining us remotely. Let's see, do we have him here? Yeah, I'm here. Hey, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me. So, so a little unclear on how all this sharing works, so I'm trying my best. Yeah, yeah. So we're, we're seeing your uh, presentation, so I think you're perfect there, and we can hear you loud and clear. So yeah, as the uh, name implies, uh, Terry's going to be speaking to us about events with Zio, Caliban, and Apache Pulsar. So I think we're going to see how a lot of the things we've talked about earlier today fit together in a large organization and how they actually made it work in practice. Yep, exactly. Um, so I'm, I'm Terry Drozdowski. I'm an engineering manager at Carvana. I'm going to talk about um, what we just recently put into production. Um, Zio with uh, Caliban and Apache Pulsar um, doing some cool stuff. Um, so we're going to talk real briefly here about what we used it for, how we used it, what the outcome was, and what some future efforts might be. Um, so let's talk about our use case. So before I do this, let's talk a little bit about Carvana because I think if you're in the United States, you, you might know who Carvana is. Um, if you're not in the U.S., you probably can't tell because we geoblock the world for for various reasons. But um, we are one of one of the largest, if not the largest, online pre-owned car um, websites in the United States. Uh, we're a fifty billion dollar company, um, pretty large organization at this point. We started adopting Zio probably about a little over a year ago, so we've been pretty early adopters on all of this. And uh, we have a couple things out in production, and uh, we are in the process of migrating from ACA to Zio. And we have a couple projects that are 100% of the way there, and some of them that are getting pretty close to being there. So, um, because of the nature of the group that I work for, I'm working for the special projects area. So, we work on projects that are not yet publicly announced. And because we're a public company, there's I can't really say what we're doing, <laughs> so I'll talk around it. But let's imagine we have an application that contains a number of long-running processes, and this is all based on user input. And that this user input comes from a user who's providing us data about their vehicle, let's say from an iOS device. So they gather all the information that they need about their vehicle, their VIN, um, uh, engine type, color everything, take pictures, submit it to us, and we do a lot of processing, long run, long running processes that occur um, over this uh, application run. So this is something that we don't want to tie up the, the user. Um, we want to do a lot of this stuff asynchronously, and all of these um, nice, nice little technologies allow us to do that. So like I said, um, user needs to be updated um, as soon as processing is completed. Um, and we have a native iOS app. So from a high level, this is sort of what our architecture looks like. Um, on the back end, we're deploying into multiple pods in Kubernetes. So it's important that we're able to scale at that level. Um, and so what we settled on using was um, GraphQL and having Caliban speak to our iOS application via queries and mutations, and then having those result in events that get pushed up to um, Pulsar. And from there, we have multiple pods on the back end waiting to service those mes messages and then produce the results back and submit them to a Z Hub where a WebSocket subscription is listening for events that are tied to that specific user or client. So all of this is 100% Zio native code. Um, we tried our best to, to to use whatever Zio libraries we could find. And um, where we couldn't, we, we wrapped uh, existing Java libraries to help with that. Um, we need Zio 1.x right now because that's what's in production. Um, but we're being smart and keeping an eye towards Zio 2 so that migration isn't a giant pain for us. So we use things like Zio Magic and, and the Service Module 2 pattern. The Pulsar client options, um, were interesting. We had a few different choices, and then um, I'll talk a little bit about what we ultimately decided to do. 
The first one was to use Pulsar for S, which is a pretty nice library ergonomically, um, like the feel and how it all set up. It has some Zio integration, but it's pretty light in that sense. Um, we wanted a stronger Zio integration. There's also a library out there called Zio Pulsar, um, which is written in Scala 3 and is currently aimed at Zio 2, and we had some issues with it. So what we ultimately decided to do was to roll our own. So by this, what we'd wound up doing was just simply taking the Java client and um, wrapping it with Zio and building our own internal library um, and providing and using Pulsar for S and Zio Pulsar as kind of a guide in terms of how to do it the right way um, to make sure we're wrapping things properly and um, not leaking resources as well as maintaining a nice ergonomic um, ergonomics for the API. So on top of that, we have an internal framework that we built. Um, and that's what you see kind of in the service pod on the right side. Um, mentioned the Java client. Um, we also created a Xeon JSON based Pulsar schema class. So if you're not familiar with Pulsar, one of the nice things about it is for the messages that live on the topics, you can define a schema class. So if you have an Avro message, you could define it in terms of Avro, um, XML and XML. Um, and so we just wrote a custom one that worked with Zio JSON and used the uh, codecs that we are already using across the project. And that made it all snap in pretty nicely. And then we created this new concept of a, an event dispatcher and an event handler. So um, we limit how many consumers we actually have from the topic, and we just have the, the consumer publish the messages to the event dispatcher, which will then find the appropriate handler and send it on to the service. And then, of course, at the front, we have Caliban. Um, and um, this was an opportunity to use subscriptions, which I think is a really cool feature of, of GraphQL and maybe not so widely used. Um, but subscriptions are backed by WebSockets. Um, the application can make a subscription to them. They authenticate over the WebSocket. Um, we learned a lot in terms of how all of this comes together, but it was all pretty seamless. Um, and Z-Hub helps us listen to the in inbound messages and then filter them out for the specific application user um, that the subscription is for. So let's look at some code examples under the hood here little bit slow. So this is just some test code um, based on the, the API that we put together. And the two things worth pointing out is um, the producer is pretty simple, um, used via the um, accessor method. And then um, the other important side was how do we add it to our layer and also make sure that it's part of a Z managed. Um, and this is all hidden here in this build from config where we can just tell it the key um, in the Hocon and behind the scenes, Zio config is going to go load up the configuration and then um, work with the um, config objects from Pulsar to build up our producer class um, and, and give it to us wrapped uh, nicely. Then on the um, consuming side, uh, this is more in the, in the dispatcher side here. Um, the, the cool thing to look at here is the consumer and how we're also calling build from config. And all we simply do is pass in the event topic we want. Um, and we give it a Pulsar subscription, which admittedly could also be part of the configuration, um, but right now is separate. Um, but subscriptions are, are a key part to Pulsar in, ter in terms of um, managing where consumers left off. Um, it'll track it by name uh, if they're durable. And there's all sorts of different types. Uh, Pulsar is a, a, a pretty deep topic on its own. Um, and then the dispatcher itself um, basically is fed a sequence of event handlers. And then each event handler itself knows what event that it's listening for and can simply grab it. Uh, or the dispatcher will forward that message to them. The dispatcher then signals whether or not uh, it was successfully processed so that the so that the message could be act or enact, uh, depending on uh, the results. So some results and, and things that we learned here. Um, we wound up with a really nice system uh, that was pretty easy to extend. Um, 
and, and that's important for us, um, makes it a lot easier for new engineers who um, aren't familiar with any of this technology to kind of jump in and say, okay, I just need to add an event handler here um, and not worry about all the gray details. Um, lesson learned from first time in with Pulsar, um, ACK and NAC those messages. Um, Pulsar has a default 60 second auto NAC and uh, you will learn the hard way um, <laughs> if you didn't spot that in the documentation quickly. Um, as you start, or re <laughs> if you have a long running process that is trying to take long, longer than 60 seconds to process a message, you're gonna see um, duplicates. Um, the other thing learned here is Pulsar is highly resilient. Uh, we haven't been able to push it over. Um, it's surviving, you know, all our consumers and producers are surviving uh, Kubernetes rolling pods uh, from the CI CD pipeline. We're not losing track of anything. Um, so far, it's been very nice in that regard. Um, it's all cloud native, which is really important to us. Um, we operate across three different, all, the three major clouds, um, primarily in Google. And so, um, you know, being cloud native and having a solution we can deploy into Kubernetes and, and just work is, is key. And of course, it's fast. Uh, we learned sometimes it's faster than our downstream services that are owned by other groups within the organization. Uh, so uh, we had to use some other trip, tips and tricks to kind of slow down uh, some of the messages and uh, apply some back pressure. Um, one of the other things I did want to talk about, and, and one of the other nice things about Kubernetes or uh, Pulsar in general is um, it does have this concept of a retry topic. So we have long running events that we're asking a service that's owned by a different group to process data for us. And unfortunately, the best thing we can do is ask them every minute, are you done yet? <laughs> so Pulsar has a native retry topic in there that allows us to do that and not worry about losing mem in memory state of, oh no, the pod rolled and I was in the middle of a retry and now I've lost track of it. Um, sure, there are other ways to do that with the database, but to be able to lean on the messaging system to just retry that message later and maybe send it to another pod that's live um, is, is really nice. And then um, the other really nice thing that we can do is for the messages that are too fast, we can tell it to schedule the message to be consumed later which is a pretty nice feature of Pulsar as well. So all this got rolled into our client where we can tell it, hey, publish this in five minutes. You could even tell it to publish it in two days if you wanted, um, and the consumers won't pick it up until that uh, time box expires. So some future efforts here. Um, there's a lot more features for Pulsar that we aren't using, and. Um, as we start using them, we're going to need to roll them into all of this. Um, we have um, an internal framework that we built around the client where it's probably not as generalized as it could be. Uh, it's one of those trade-offs with uh, time versus, uh, you know, doing things right. Sometimes you got to take a shortcut, and so those need to get cleaned up. Um, we need to get to, um, well, let's, let's just say I would like to get to ZO2 uh, as soon as we can and, and ultimately Scala 3. I think ZO2 is a bit more important to us in, in terms of, uh, you know, improving code use. Um, in our organization and, and at least in the job market right now, it's extremely difficult to hire Scala engineers. And so being able to hire engineers with different backgrounds and bring them along into Scala and ZO is important. So having the right frameworks that are easy to use and have good ergonomics is critical in this situation. Um, Scala 3 will be nice too, but um, there's nothing really pressing us on that at the moment. Um, and open source, I, I don't know, maybe at some point we can figure out how to uh, open source some of this and, and make the, the general client and framework that we built uh, available to everyone. So that's it. Um, thanks, guys. Uh, appreciate the time. Um, just a shameless plug here that we are hiring like mad. Um, so if you want to work with Scala and do cool stuff in Zio, um, reach out to me on Discord um, at, at Zymox. Thank you. Oh, my God. Zymox. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know who Terry was, but I know Zymox. 
Uh, great talk, Simon. <laughs>